Hi. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. It's always great to be in uh, Washington, and it's always great to uh, have time to spend with uh, with Ben Lerner and Frank Gaffney and all of all of you wonderful people who who care so much about the issues that are important. Um, and so I come to you today, uh, the day after uh, President uh, Obama gave his uh, stirring defense of his nuclear deal with Iran. And um, if, if I think if we wanted to boil down the president's message yesterday at American University, I think it, it boils down to uh, um, just a couple of points. One is that uh, the only way that you can oppose this deal is if you are disloyal to the United States by placing Israel's national security interest uh, above America's national security interest. Those interests, he claims, are not uh, actually uh, in contradiction today, but it's just that the Israeli people have it completely wrong, and he knows better than Israel what's good for it, and, um, and therefore he should be listened to, and not Netanyahu, and not the Israeli people who oppose the deal that he struck with the Mullah. Um, and then the other uh, group of people, of course, um, who, who oppose this deal are, are Republican partisans who, as he made clear, he views uh, as the uh, moral equivalents of uh, American-hating uh, uh, mullahs and jihadists in Iran that call daily uh, death to America. Of course, uh, I guess that would include Supreme Leader of Iran, Ali Khamenei, because he he led a very large audience in chanting that after uh, the deal was concluded in Vienna on July 14th. Uh, be that as it may, he, he did say that those are the only two possible ways that one can oppose this deal, um, by being either disloyal to the United States, um, and being a partisan and a political hack who places uh, party politics above the national interests of the United States. And um, I think, uh, I think obviously, you know, and the major purpose of these kinds of things is twofold. One is uh, to intimidate Democratic lawmakers into uh, standing by the president against uh, the Republicans and against uh, uh, the Jews um, and the Jewish state uh, by rallying the troops because really he only needs um, a third of the members of the House and a third of the members of, of the Senate in order to uh, in order to allow this deal to go into force and and end American sanctions on Iran. Um, so that's the first reason. And the second reason is to prevent debate, right? Because if you demonize your political opponents, um, then you don't have to actually delve into the substance of this of this deal. And I think that therefore it behooves us to delve into the substance of this deal a bit and think about um, what actually is, is at stake here and, and what this deal means, not, not so much for Israel, uh, which I think uh, many people understand, but rather to, to understand how this deal impacts American national security. Um, I think, in fact, that in, in recent years, since in 2003, the Iranian opposition group exposed the existence of the uh, illicit nuclear installation at uh, Isfahan and at Natanz, um, and this this uh, issue really erupted on the international agenda right after the U.S. invasion of Iran of Iraq. Um, much of the debate about the nature of the Iranian nuclear threat has been dominated by why this threat poses an existential threat to the state of Israel. Um, and I think it's clear that uh, Iran is the leading state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, Hezbollah, one of the largest terror armies in the world, is it was developed and invented by the Iranians, together with the PLO, by the way, uh, in Beirut in 1992. It is an Iranian foreign legion to all intents and purposes. It operates not only in, in Lebanon, but throughout the Middle East and, and as well in, in Latin America. Um, and in Europe, um, and Hamas has since 2005 come under the Iranian aegis and has become an agent of Iran as well. And many of the Pakistani uh, terrorist organizations that operate against India are also 
part of the Iranian nexus. Um, so I think, you know, we understand that this is this is a terrorist uh, regime. This is a terrorist sponsoring regime, and it is pledged to the annihilation of Israel. So having nuclear ha uh, arms in the hands of these people, uh, it, it does in fact constitute a mortal threat to the Jewish state. But um, first of all, what what does this deal do? The steel. A lot of people are struck by the fact that the inspections regime that Obama claims is really, really the bedrock of this agreement, and and the reason why it's such a great achievement is really actually a, a disaster. We already saw reports yesterday came out in Bloomberg and today in the Wall Street Journal that the Iranians are already breaching. Uh, in material breach of the agreement by trying to cleanse the uh, suspected military nuclear site at Parchin outside of Qom um, where they were developing detonators and other military aspects of their nuclear bomb program um, and that they are not allowing international inspectors to visit the site uh, in breach and material breach of the agreement that they signed or didn't sign or uh, acceded to uh, just uh, two and a half weeks ago in Vienna. Um, so this deal, though, essentially says it, it's not simply that the inspections are no good and that it gives Iran 24 days to wipe clean any site that uh, the international community exposes. Um, and therefore uh, makes a joke out of the whole concept of intrusive inspections because you can only inspect what you already know about. You can't inspect things that you only discover along the way because Iran cheats. Um, I think that the real issue here is not even in the details of the time lapse between discovery of a new nuclear site and the ability to inspect it. I think that the real issue here is what this, what this, what this, what this uh, agreement does in the big picture. And in the big picture, it does two main things. It enriches Iran immediately in the form of the signing bonus that we all know about to the tune of $150 billion that the Iranians are due to receive over the next several months, uh, money that's been frozen in foreign banks uh, because of the UN sanctions regime that have been placed on the Iranians. Um, and, and this money, uh, the $150 billion and then the hundreds of billions of dollars more that Iran is set to, to receive through oil deals and reintroduction into the international banking system and massive commercial inflows into Iran on the part of eager uh, European, Russian, Chinese and other businessmen, women, um, I think all of these things are clear that if you're talking about Iran, which is a rogue state, which is a state with uh, hegemonic ambitions in the Middle East and genocidal ambitions uh, uh, towards Israel and towards the United States, and also with uh, international aspirations to foment an international jihad, um, then you understand that putting that kind of money in the hands of the rulers of this regime um, is is a recipe for disaster. This is doubly so when, you know, although in sharp contrast to the claims of the Obama administration, this regime is not likely to use its windfall uh, to finance domestic economic growth, to pay pensions, to worry about uh, issues like drug addiction or anything else, or liberalizing the Islamic legal code, God forbid. Um, none, none of that is likely to transpire, frankly, because Iran is one of the most repressive human rights abusing regimes on the face of the planet. These are the leadership of Iran uh, does not care about the welfare of, of their people. This has been clear since 1979. They have one of the highest capital punishment rates in, in the world. I believe that they surpassed China in the past 12 months um, of Rouhani's supposedly moderate uh, presidency. Um, so you see that this, this is a regime that is fundamentally involved with human rights abuses, both at home and abroad. They are terrorists supporting, they have global aspirations, regional hegemonic aspirations and global jihadist aspirations genocidal aspirations in relation to Israel and to the United States. So the idea of putting this kind of money, and, and in the case of the you know, sanctions relief, uh, $150 billion immediately in the hands of the leaders of Iran is indeed a recipe for mayhem on a scale that we haven't seen. So that, that's first of all the first very devastating aspect of this deal is the sanctions relief. And the second devastating aspect is 
that it does, in fact, involve, the deal does, in fact, guarantee, as President Obama said in his interview with NPR, um, it guarantees that they will have zero breakout time uh, towards the uh, development at will of nuclear bombs and warheads the moment that this, uh, that the sunset clause of this agreement sets in in 10 or 15 years, so that this guarantees that Iran will become a nuclear power at the end of this agreement if it abides by the agreement. And, of course, because the inspections regime is so weak and so laughable, it also gives Iran... Uh, limitless, essentially, uh, capacity to cheat on this agreement. And then the other aspect to that, of the way that it guarantees that Ar Iran will become a nuclear power, is first of all, they get the money. Now, once they get the money, Iran essentially doesn't need to remain in the deal any longer because the whole concept of snapback sanctions doesn't really work and they don't really have to worry about harming their economy in a, in a fundamental way if they leave the agreement. And also, as David Albright said of the Institute of Science and International Security, I think in Senate testimony the day before yesterday, Iran's actually current breakout time is more, is, or that the, 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 sorry, that the, the, uh, the under the agreement, it isn't that Iran will have to, it will need another year in order to break out, but rather just a few months, just months. So that this whole thing, you're, you're giving them billions and billions of dollars in sanctions relief, you're opening up the Iranian economy, you're guaranteeing them a nuclear bomb and all of this in order to set back their capacity to develop nu nuclear weapons. This is if you take everything just sort of on the level and don't delve too deeply into the means that Iran can cheat on this deal and is in fact already cheating on this deal. You're saying that you're doing all of this in order to extend the period that Iran requires to develop nuclear weapons by three or four months. That's all we're talking about here. Other analysts have claimed that all it does is, or is prolong their required time to develop nuclear weapons by a few, by a month, by four weeks. So the, the basic justification for this deal is 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 sort of pathetic. Um, and again, it, it enables Iran to, at the end, guarantees that there will be a nuclear state, that they will have nuclear bombs. They'll have nuclear bombs, they will be wealthy, and during the course of the agreement, of course, if they agree to abide by, oh, let me just, uh, uh, parenthetically, I forgot to close that last point, which is that in accordance with the agreement, Iran can leave the agreement, vacate its signature on the agreement, with five weeks' notice at any time. So that if Iran is cheating all along, and we see with their refusal to allow international inspectors into the Parchin uh, facility uh, this week, um, that they are cheating, um, then they can be developing nuclear bombs and delivery mechanisms from the get-go. I mean, it's in fact probably been happening continuously since the interim deal that the United States concluded with the Iranians in November of 2013 placed no restrictions on Iran's ballistic missile uh, operations. So whenever they're done, they can leave. They're within their rights under this agreement to do so. They give five weeks notice. They're out. They conduct a nuclear test. And that's it. They have become the new North Korea. So that this deal, the concept, the idea that that this deal in any way, shape, or form prevents Iran from becoming a nuclear power is false and contemptuous of the intelligence of, of, of uh, the American public and of the global community. So, um, so that's what it does. It enriches Iran and it gives them nuclear bombs. It also does another thing, of course, which is that although the, the, the administration would have us believe that Iran has to wait eight years before the sanctions on ballistic missile uh, technology transfers to Iran uh, ends, the, the, the actual text of the UN Security Council resolution is not, is, it does not require Iran to wait at all. It says that they'll do their best efforts or, or some such nonsense. In, in other words, they have no limitations on their ability to acquire ballistic missile technologies today. But even if they did, even if they had to wait for eight years, the lifespan of this agreement is supposed to be 10 years or 15 years, depending on who you're asking. At the end of this period, according to President Obama and every expert in the field, Iran will have a clear path to nuclear weapons at will that they can develop at will to the tune of a dozen nuclear weapons a month. Um, and um, 
if they're only allowed to develop ICBM technology in eight years, that means that they will have ICBMs in their possession when this deal expires, so that they will have the warheads and they will have the means to deliver them anywhere they'd like on the face of the planet when this deal uh, expires. Again, on the best case scenario that the deal is adhered to by the Iranians throughout its lifespan as, as detailed in the agreement. Now, um, again, we have talked about this agreement to the mo to, to the, the, the dominant theme of the discussion that has been taking place worldwide about this agreement and, and the dominant theme that, that, that President Obama clearly wanted Americans to focus on yesterday in his, in his speech in, in American University was that this is primarily viewed as a threat to Israel's national security. I mean, he, he went, it was very clear in signaling, singling out Israel in his remarks um, yesterday, claiming that Israelis are the only uh, people, the only government that has put, spoken out publicly in, op publicly in opposition to this deal are the Israelis. And so he made very clear he is, he is, he is trying to isolate Israel in the minds of the American public, in the minds of democratic lawmakers, um, because it's very important to him that the message that's taken away is that this deal, if it poses a threat at all, and he claims that it does not, it poses a threat only in, in the minds of, of the leaders of the Jewish state, and really they don't know what they're talking about. He said Prime Minister Netanyahu is wrong, he's right, Obama's right, he has Israel's best interests at heart, and, and Democratic lawmakers can take that to the bank. Um, maybe, maybe not. I mean, and the truth of the matter is, is that from an American perspective, <laughs> It's important, obviously, whether this agreement uh, threatens Israel or not, but Israel is an independent state, and the security cabinet of the government of Israel uh, voted unanimously that this, that this agreement is, that Israel does not accept the terms of this agreement, and that Israel is not a party to this agreement, and that Israel will not abide by the terms of the agreement. Now, it's true that the security council, the security cabinet in Israel, which is the, the, the legal body that is empowered to make these kinds of decisions in, in according to to, uh, Israeli law, they, they made this decision before the Chapter 7 resolution was passed at the UN Security Council. However, um, you know, this is a question for the lawyers, what does the fact that it's a binding resolution in the UN mean? Because probably this is superseded by the causes belly that's set, up, set out in the UN Charter for clear and imminent threat to, to the survival of Israel, to the national security of Israel. At any rate, Israel is not a party to this agreement. Its government has stated outright that it doesn't view itself as committed to this agreement. But if two-thirds of lawmakers in, in the United States do not oppose this deal actively uh, next month, then the United States will be committed to this agreement. The President signed it. The United States was a sponsor of the UN Security Council resolution that anchored this deal in international law, giving it the force, the binding force of international law. So if, if Congress doesn't kill this deal um, when it, when it re- uh, when, when it reconvenes in September, then the United States will be uh, required to abide by it. So then the question that people have to ask is, is, is President Obama correct? Is the only way that one can oppose this deal is if one is concerned about Israel and doesn't believe the President when he says that he has Israel's back? Or if one is a Republican partisan who is motivated solely by an interest in weakening the Democratic Party and the Democratic President. And, and I, I would offer the answer that, that no, in fact, that is not true. Um, I think that this deal, just a very casual look at, at what Iran is doing, the threats that Iran manifests to the United States, I think make clear that Iran is a, is a significant strategic threat to the United States, to its national security, to its economy, and to, to its basic well-being as a society. Um, and that this deal exacerbates all of the threats that Iran poses uh, to the United States in very fundamental ways. Um, so I think I just want to run through, uh, if you don't mind, a list of the, the ways that Iran is threatening and harming the United States and ask ourselves whether the agreement that Obama signed or, or acceded to with the Iranian regime uh, improves 
America's position vis-a-vis -vis these Iranian threats or harms America's position vis-a-vis -vis these threats. <coughs> so the first way, of course, the most graphic way that Iran uh, threatens the United States is by holding American hostages. Today there are four American citizens that are being held hostage by Iran, uh, illegally uh, uh, imprisoned, some like Robert Levinson, the former FBI, Officer are being held, have been held incognito for a number of years. Jason Razian of the uh, Washington Post is now the subject of a show trial um, that I think is being held in camera to a large degree. So, you know, th these are the pastor uh, and and uh, the marine. These are all American hostages. And so the question is, all right, uh, Obama and, and President uh, and uh, Secretary of State John Kerry would have us believe that due to the goodwill that the United States has generated among the uh, Ayatollahs in Iran, uh, that now that this deal has, be, through this deal, the United States now has uh, more of a chance of convincing them out of the kindness of their hearts to free the hostages that they have been uh, holding uh, in some cases for many years. Um, and the question is, is this true? Well, again, given that the statements that have been made by Iranian leaders since July 14th, since this agreement was concluded in Vienna, all point to the fact that Iran has not in any way, shape, or form abandoned its contemptuous hatred of the United States and its desire to destroy the United States. Um, it would seem that no such goodwill has been generated. Iran has rejected American uh, moves to try to collaborate uh, with Tehran to settle the Syrian war um, and all of the other attempts that the United States has made with regards to the battle against the Islamic State in Iraq and in Syria have been rejected by the Iranian regime. So the truth of the matter is that when you're dealing with a terrorist regime like Iran, right, you who is holding your hostages, the minute that you concede what they want, and in Iran's case what they wanted was international legitimization of their nuclear weapons program on the one hand and sanctions relief on the other, and the United States just gave them both of those things, Iran no longer has any reason, any motivation to have goodwill gestures to the United States, to make those kinds of, of uh, gestures, in, including freeing the American hostages. So in fact, this deal, far from generating good faith, it has expanded Iranian contempt for the United States, and it has destroyed the leverage the United States held in its hand for the past uh, many years, which is the ability to uh, legitimize on the one hand Iran's nuclear efforts and on the other hand um, to relieve the sanctions regime that was placed on Iran. So this, the, the plight of the hostages, the American citizens are being held unlawfully by the Iranian regime has been harmed dramatically by this deal. So aside from that, we have, of course, the terrorist threat emanating from Iran towards the United States. And here I think you have to look at, at, at two different things. In 2011, the FBI uncovered an Iranian plot to attack, uh, to, to kill the Saudi ambassador in, in Washington, D.C. at a Georgetown Cafe, and also to bomb the Israeli and Saudi embassies in the city. Um, one of the Iranian operatives who was supposed to participate in this terrorist attack uh, penetrated American territory from Mexico. And uh, I think, you know, there are two things that we learned from this attack, right? One is that Iran continues to actively seek to conduct terrorist operations against the United States, against American interests on American soil and as well is operating in other countries around America. Now I think that the fact that the, the terrorists penetrated the United States from Mexico is important because it indicates as well something that we need to be taking a much closer look at and understanding how the deal impacts adversely from an American national security perspective and that is the vast presence of Iran 
uh, and the Iranian regime, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, and Hezbollah throughout Latin America, and particularly their hubs of operations are in Nicaragua, Ecuador, Venezuela, and uh, Bolivia. And they also, as we saw with the assassination of uh, the Argentine prosecutor on, Jul on January 18th, Alberto Nisman, uh, they also have a very collaborative uh, relationship with the Ar Argentine government. Just for people who are unfamiliar, Alberto Nisman was the Argentine prosecutor charged with investigating the 1994 uh, attack against the Amia Jewish Cultural Center in Buenos Aires. 85 people were murdered in that car bombing in 1994. And um, Alberto Nisman uh, was responsible for investigating the crime. And in December and in November of 2014, he made statements indicating and held press conference revealing that um, he had uncovered direct collaboration between Cristina Kirchner, the president of Argentina, and the Iranian regime that uh, Kirchner agreed to spring the Iranian suspects and to cleanse the plate uh, of uh, accusations against Iran in exchange for Iran's agreement to buy grain uh, from Argentina. And um, so, uh, this is, of course, uh, cooperation at the highest echelons of both the Argentine government and the Iranian government. The Iranian uh, defense minister himself was uh, the mastermind of the 1994 attack, which is the largest anti-Semitic attack in the world uh, since the Holocaust. And um, so you see Iran operating openly. And um, according to Wall Street Journal columnist uh, Mary Anastasia O'Grady, uh, the suspect list of the people who may have murdered Nisman all point to the notion that he was assassinated. It was a hit order by the Iranian regime. And, and the reason that he was assassinated when he was on January 18th is because on January 19th he was about to hold a press conference. He was set to hold a press conference where he was going to expose all of Iran's terrorist operations in Latin America. Now, you know, Americans are just not really focused on Latin America. For whatever reason, Americans have often taken Latin America for granted, um, have not recognized the strategic threat that hostile regimes operating in, in condominium with uh, terrorist regimes like Iran can have on American national security. But it, it's not simply that it's a terrorist threat, it's also a strategic threat because Iran, for instance, their compound in Nicaragua is really a military base for the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. The Iranian base in Managua is the largest foreign embassy in Managua. Um, and they are involved with the, now it's on hold because uh, the Nicaraguans don't have the money to do it, but of dredging the canal between the Caribbean Sea and the Pacific Ocean the, on the Isthmus of, of Nicaragua. And uh, this was a major undertaking. This is a Chinese deal and the Iranians want to be involved in it as well. Um, this is a strategic threat to the United States to have an enemy regime involved in the development of such a strategic uh, waterway. Um, and um, there have been reports over the past decade that Iran, again, through its revolutionary guards and their front or operation, their front companies, which control 20% of the Iranian economy, are involved in uranium mining in Ecuador and in Bolivia and in Venezuela. And the Venezuelans, together with the Cubans, have been responsible for uh, furnishing uh, false documents for at least 173 uh, Hezbollah terrorists and Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps that can then use those false papers and false identities that are, are quite exquisite from what I understand to travel freely throughout uh, the Americas and, and enter into this country as Venezuelan citizens. Um, so you know, this, is, this, this manifests a very serious danger for the United States. When you add to that the threat of um, electromagnetic pulse attacks, which are attacks where you 
put a nuclear device, and it can be crewed, on the top of a surface-to-air missile or surface -to -air ballistic missile of any kind, short range, it doesn't matter. Um, and you can launch it from wherever. You can launch it from a commercial ship. You can launch it from, from, from uh, ground, whatever you want, or from a satellite. And you detonate the nuclear device uh, a few hundred uh, kilometers in the air, miles in the air, over your target country, and you fry the electric grid. And you essentially, this is something that you know Frank Gaffney has been spearheading the work on on the Hill, uh, together with Congressman Trent Franks. Um, this is something that can uh, essentially send the United States back to the 19th century in, in a split second, uh, because it destroys America's uh, uh, communications networks, it, it destroys America's uh, electronic grid, uh, power grid, and this will lead to mass starvation, to the loss at a minimum of over $100 billion to the American economy in one fell swoop. And this just massive de de devastation that nobody has really thought about uh, outside of uh, Capitol Hill. I mean, the EMP Commission of, of Congress put out its uh, recommendation several years ago for the United for the executive to start hardening the uh, electric grid in this country, and Obama has done nothing. Actually, NORAD has moved back, is moving back now at a cost of $800 million, I think, to the Cheyenne Mountain uh, base that they had occupied during the Cold War. Um, because they want to be able to maintain uh, America's uh, military capabilities in the event of an EMP attack, but American civilian centers are completely unprotected from, from this threat. And again, this is something that Iran could carry out without too much difficulty from Latin America, from any one of its bases, or even seabound uh, on the Caribbean Sea to the United States with no problem. They've already uh, shot off uh, uh, satellites in what looked like failed launches, but actually were later recognized as perhaps being EMP uh, tests. So this is something that they could do. It's a strategic threat to the United States. And by the way, all of America's uh, missile defense batteries are pointed north towards the Soviet Union, a former Soviet Union. Nobody's looking south, which is where the real threat is emanating from today from, from the Iranian bases in Latin America and Central America, South and Central America. And uh, so this is, this is a major threat, a strategic threat to the United States of America that's emanating from Iran. Now, when, when you talk about these things, you again have to ask yourself, okay, now, it's true that, uh, as John Kerry and, and President Obama have made clear, right, this deal is supposed to be limited only to Iran's nuclear program. And the United States, they say, is going to continue to maintain its vigilant, vigilant confrontational posture towards Iran on everything else. Even if this were true, if we take them at their word on this and we don't question for even a moment uh, uh, the veracity of, or, or the sincerity of their, of their claim, the question is what is, will the fact of this deal impact, right, will it impact their capacity to maintain that vigilance, to limit Iran's capacity to do damage, whether, hi Frank, whether on the EMP, um, threat level, on the terrorist level, on the level of maintaining and expanding their presence in Latin America, buying off additional Latin American governments, perhaps the Mexican government, uh, in, in their war to surround the United States or not. And I would argue that this government actually, this, uh, this nuclear agreement actually expands the threats in these other areas and expands the threats in these other areas because for two reasons. One, again, goes to the money, right? As, uh, as Ms. O'Grady in the Wall Street Journal explained in a column two weeks ago, the massive windfall profit that Iran is about to pocket, no strings attached, due to their ascension to the nuclear deal, enables them, again, $150 billion is, a, is an enormous amount of money, by all accounts. It's an enormous amount of money. Times more, for instance, than Israel has received since its founding in, in financial assistance from the United States. Right, so, I mean, just to give you the scale, this is, this is an, an extraordinary amount of money. And it's all in one fell swoop. So you're flushed with cash. You can essentially do anything you want with that kind of money. And again, it's cash. 
So that money alone is going to expand Iran's efforts. By the way, the Revolutionary Guards operations in Latin America, the various uh, companies that have been engaged in uranium enrichment uh, in places like Ecuador and Bolivia have been under your UN sanctions. But now all of these Revolutionary Guard Corps companies that have been operating in Latin America, uh, some in violation of the uh, UN Security Council sanctions resolutions, are now going to be able to reinstate, reinvigorate, and expand their operations in Iraq, in uh, Venezuela, and in Ecuador, and, and in Bolivia. Uh, without any fear of repercussions from the international community or the expansions of sanctions as a result of their violations. The governments that are hosting them are not going to have to worry about any repercussions for their hosting of these terrorist entities. Um, so all of these things are massive threats to the United States, right? Because the more Iran expands its operations in Latin America, the more the United States is at risk. Because the clear target of these operations is the United States of America, it's not Israel. Now, this brings us to two other aspects of the Iranian threat. One is, if we want to expand the terrorist operations and what Iran is doing, you know, there's been a, a debate in, in Washington over the past decade, actually, about what manifests a greater threat to American national security, Iran or Al-Qaeda, right? And, and the, the, the basic assumption, never actually proven, was that they operate separately, that they are separate and distinct threats, Al-Qaeda on the one hand, Iran on the other, and never the twain shall meet. Now the fact is that there was never any uh, reason to make this assumption because Iran's sponsorship, support for cooperation with Al-Qaeda has been going on since the mid-1990s. And as the 9-11 Commission showed in its final report, four of the 9-11 terrorists transited Iran on their way to the United States. Um, ahead of the 9-11 attacks, so that there was cooperation between Al-Qaeda at the operational and at the senior levels dating back from the mid-1990s when Al-Qaeda decamped from Sudan and uh, ha it continued during the 9-11 period. Now what about since 9-11? Well, first of all, we know that after the Battle of Tora Bora in Afghanistan at the end of 2002, that the Al-Qaeda leadership from Pakistan decamped to Iran and continued to operate there. We know that Abu Musab Zarqawi, who became the head of Al-Qaeda operations in Iraq and was killed by coalition forces in 2006, operated from Iran. He received his operational orders and guidance from Iran while he was fomenting the Al-Qaeda uh, insurgency in Iraq and, and, and uh, causing such mayhem. We also know that ISIS is then the offspring of Al-Qaeda in Iraq um, and that uh, Musawi was essentially the, the father of uh, ISIS. But we know more than that, right? We know that in 2011, Navy SEALs entered into Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, and killed the Al-Qaeda leader. And during that operation, they seized hard drives and computers with 1.5 million documents, uh, give or take. And uh, according to Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, who's the recently retired uh, director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, those documents point to ongoing deep and strategic cooperation between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. Now, as Stephen Hayes from the Weekly Standard has been pointing out for the past several months, um, the administration has refused to uh, make publish to make public the contents of those documents. Even more alarming, the White House has prevented intelligence officers from the DIA and CENTCOM from examining the contents of those Al-Qaeda documents. There was an initial sort of triage done on the documents to get information about plots that were being carried out or in the planning stages at the time of Osama bin Laden's assassination. But after that, there was a period of several months where nobody even touched those documents, which is simply 
alarming. And since then, according to extraordinary reporting that's been done on this issue by Stephen Hayes, um, the government, the White House, which controls access to these uh, these documents in a sort of weird way that that apparently is not is not generally done in in the case of, of seized documents of this type, uh, has denied access to them. Of the 1.5 million documents that were seized, only uh, only a hundred or so have even been released to the public. So that's, can you just turn that off, I forget. So we have a situation here where you have a treasure trove of information that is pointing to strategic, deep, and ongoing and operational uh, cooperation between Al-Qaeda and Iran, and nobody's uh, doing anything about it. And in fact, the White House is deliberately hiding this fact, both from the military, which is being denied open access to these extremely important documents, and of course to the American public. And I want to get back to the larger issue that we see exposed by this, by this White House operation in a moment, but just a word about the nuclear threat itself, right? Because, again, I think much to the detriment of American discourse, uh, the discussion, the debate for the past several years regarding Iran's illicit nuclear weapons program has centered on the threat that Iran manifests to the state of Israel. And it's to the detriment of American national security because as a result of the Israel-centric focus of the debate, the issue of Iran's strategic threat to the United States has been thrown by the wayside. So that people who are champions of this agreement claim, right, that it's, it's the president's word against the Israeli prime ministers whether this is a good deal or a bad deal for America. The Israeli Prime Minister, of course, is only, or his job is to con be concerned about Israel's national security. So it's not surprising that his focus is a laser focus on how this impacts Israel. But the American political discourse should actually not be focused on Israel, it should be focused on the United States. And this again brings me to the issue of the ICBMs, right? Because as Prime Minister Netanyahu has said, those ICBMs are not for Israel, they are for the United States of America. The fact that Iran is interested in developing intercontinental ballistic missiles that are capable of reaching America's shores and acquiring them at the same time that they are actively pursuing nuclear bombs, nuclear technology, uranium enrichment to bomb grade levels, and conducting tests on detonators for nuclear warheads. What is clear enough is that from their perspective, just as we see in their vast operational infrastructure in Latin America, Iran continues to be focused on expanding their ability to actually enact their daily chance of death to America. And the ICBMs that they wish to develop and can develop under the agreement that the Obama administration concluded with the Mulocracy Together with the fact that as President Obama himself has acknowledged, uh, this deal will end if it ends. When this deal ends, Iran's breakout time to nuclear capabilities will be zero. And you add to that the fact that this deal is enriching Iran in the immediate, in the immediate term to the tune of $150 billion. And as uh, a former Israeli ambassador to the United States, Michael Oren, said, in actual fact, the sum total of their future revenues will probably be more along the lines, or profits as a result of this deal, more along the lines of $700 billion. So you're looking at a profoundly dangerous uh, development for American national security, for the threat to the United States of America. And here I just want to go back for a second to the issue of the hidden intelligence, the hidden documents on on, on American, on, on Iranian cooperation with, with Al-Qaeda. Now, because I think that it points to one of the most malicious aspects of this deal from an American national security perspective. It, it, it sort of beggars belief that, an, uh, that a White House would seek to hide both from intelligence agencies as well as from the public evidence that it has gathered pointing to 
direct Iranian cooperation with al-Qaeda and to show that actually these two threats that Americans have considered uh, uh, separate from one another are in fact integrally linked to one another, are in fact in many ways the same threat. Why would they hide this? And here we come to the most pernicious aspect of this deal from an American perspective, which is that in order to justify this deal, it is insufficient to simply castigate your political opponents or those who oppose you, uh, the lawmakers who oppose you as partisan hacks or uh, Israel firsters. You also have to hide from them evidence that would cause them to have more reason to oppose it, right? that would actually show that their opposition to this has nothing to do with either the fact that they are Republicans or the fact that they support actually that it's an act of patriotism to oppose this deal which threatens America. So it, if, if the public understands the depth of Al-Qaeda collaboration with Iran, presumably, from the White House's perspective, that will harm the capacity of the White House to sell this deal to the American public and to Democratic lawmakers who have to support this deal in order to prevent uh, the majorities in both houses of Congress from getting a veto-proof majority to oppose the, the uh, nuclear deal. So in other words, this deal requires the American government, including the State Department and the Justice Department, to act as Iranian agents. They have to actually not be apologists for Iran towards the American people, hide Iranian uh, threats to the United States from the American public, because if they don't do that, then they cannot justify their policy. This policy requires the President of the United States, again, to be an Iranian agent. This is an extraordinary thing. Now, when, when President Obama concluded his remarks yesterday, he made a statement to the effect, and I don't have the direct quote in front of me, but that uh, he claimed that if Congress opposes this deal, that it will be a, a blow to American, America's diplomatic credibility, and that America's diplomatic credibility has been the anchor of the international system. And therefore, a congressional uh, uh, rejection of this deal is going to uh, destroy essentially the American power based system that has been uh, uh, extant in the in the Middle East for the past 70 years or so. The thing about it is that Obama has it exactly backwards because the thing that destroys American diplomatic credibility, American military credibility, American uh, credibility as an ally, the credibility of America's nonproliferation efforts uh, is the deal itself, right? Because from, from the perspective of American allies, if you're a Saudi or an Israeli, hearing uh, Defense Secretary Ashton Carter uh, saying we're going to protect your, you know, m we're going we're gonna to protect you from Iran. We're going to we're going to give you uh, defensive systems or military systems that are going to be able that are going to enable you to counter the threat from Iran that may grow as a result of this agreement, which of course it shouldn't by by Iran by Obama's own telling because this is supposed to make Iran less threatening. But be that as it may, um, nobody can trust an American defense secretary when he makes these kinds of statements when he says we're going to guarantee your national security because the United States is rendering vulnerable its own national security. So if the United States through this deal is actually endangering itself, then there's no value to America's strategic guarantees because you can't trust a strategic basket case, which is essentially what the United States becomes as a result of this agreement. And that's from an alliance perspective. It loses all credibility. The United States loses all credibility with its allies because we see America, right, taking actions that directly harm its, its national security. And when you consider either the nuclear threat or the EMP threat, is actually taking steps that render vulnerable its, its own survival. 
and that's one. And, you know, nonproliferation. So Obama says that uh, this isn't going to change the non nuclear nonproliferation treaty, that this has no impact whatsoever, or it actually advances the cause of nonproliferation. To, but, of course, this is a joke, right? I mean, there, there's no credibility to these statements whatsoever because the minute that the United States legitimizes an Iran armed with nuclear weapons, then it's destroyed the entire nonproliferation regime that the United States has been fostering since, since the end of World War II. There is no nuclear nonproliferation uh, policy of America any longer because 70 years of nonproliferation uh, uh, policy, uh, the, the infrastructure of nonproliferation that the United States has set up, not only the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, but a whole host of agreements that the Americans have, have agreed to with the South Koreans, with the Japanese, as well as with the, the states of the region of the Middle East, um, they've all been cast asunder. There's, America has no say any longer. It has no credibility on the issue of nuclear nonproliferation because the United States is now shepherding Iran, enabling Iran, paving the way for Iran to enter into the club of nuclear powers uh, with no questions asked, no guilt involved. And then, um, so, so that's, that's from a nonproliferation perspective. America's uh, maritime uh, uh, guarantee to, to the freedom of the seas, which has been one of the primary tasks of the U.S. Navy from uh, the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. I mean, this has been from the outset of, of, of the American Navy uh, protecting international commerce uh, and maritime traffic has been one of the primary goals of the Navy. But today, uh, just today, uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard shot at a U.S. naval uh, craft in the Straits of Hormuz. And, of course, in, Ma in May, we saw two uh, aggressive actions. One, an act of international piracy, actually, on the part of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards uh, Corps in, in the Straits of Hormuz. First, the, uh, the surrounding and chasing of uh, the U.S. flagged uh, Maersk Kensington, and then several days later, the interdiction of the U.S. Uh, of the Marshall Islands uh, flagged uh, uh, Maersk Tigris, whose uh, team, whose, whose crew was actually held hostage by Iran and Bandar Abbas for two weeks before being allowed to go free after uh, Maersk paid them whatever ransom they, they demanded. So, you know, they have an interest and they are moving forward with harming international shipping to the detriment of the global economy, uh, rendering, um, rendering, uh, how shall we say, uh, invalid America's own credibility as a global naval power. You couple this, of course, with the decommissioning of so many naval craft under the Obama administration and, and you see that you're really seeing a collapse of America uh, as a global power, uh, and people as it, of its reputation, of its capacity as well, because I don't know if you guys recall, but in May when the Maersk was taken captive by the Revolutionary Guards, the Navy, through the Pentagon spokesman, said they didn't know why Iran was doing this. They were giving the mullahs the benefit of the doubt after they had committed an act of international piracy in one of the most strategic waterways and chokeholds of the international economy in the world. When you add to that the Houthi takeover of Yemen and the fact that Iran has made no bones about the fact that as a result of the Houthi takeover they see themselves and the, Iran and the Arabs fear that they wish to dominate ba uh, the Bab al Mandab, which is the waterway that connects the uh, Persian Gulf uh, to the sea, right? Uh, so then they would have a chokehold on both naval uh, shipping lanes from Saudi Arabia and from the Middle East in general to the world, aside from, of course, the Mediterranean Sea. So this, this is a fundamental threat to the global economy. This isn't just, you know, uh, uh, somebody, uh, some uh, Jewish lobby, you know, s sitting around, you know, uh, twirling their mustaches trying to figure out how to convince uh, others to do, do their bidding. This is, these are real threats to the United States, to the global economy, to U.S. power, to U.S. wealth, and to U.S. survival um, that are all exacerbated by this deal, they are all exacerbated by a policy that requires the United States to act as the agents 
of its worst enemies, the Iranians who are pledged to its destruction. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, I hope that, that people will use the next uh, several weeks until Congress has to vote on the nuclear deal to really sit back and consider um, what this deal doesn't mean to Israel per se, but what it means to the United States and how this causes massive harm to the United States' national security and national interests both at home and throughout the world. Um, because I, I think that then we see that Obama's central claim in his speech yesterday at American University and indeed the central claim of the administration since uh, they signed the interim uh, nuclear framework uh, deal with the Iranians in, in November 2013, that the only way that you can oppose this is if you are a Republican partisan or if you are in the throes, if you are under the influence of a foreign power, meaning the Jews. Um, is false, that you cannot support this agreement if you care about America's national security, that opposing this agreement is a supreme act of patriotism, and supporting this agreement is, is signing with, with something, with a policy that places, that imperils the United States. So I think, I think that that, I'm hoping, you know, that this can become, it must become the focus of this discussion in this city and throughout the United States in, in the coming weeks because, you know, everybody understands, right, that this deal imperils Israel. The Israeli left, God bless them, are, you know, in mourning after Obama's speech because he essentially cashiered America's uh, strategic alliance with Israel yesterday, um, and it's very dis disconcerting and depressing and devastating for Israelis who have always trusted the United States and now have been, been betrayed in such a fundamental way by the White House and by the American president, and then in such a public way as well. Um, and and this, is, this is, of course, for, for an American source of concern, but a source of anguish and, and deep-seated uh, uh, vigilance an extraordinary action has to be taken when you recognize that not only does this does this deal uh, indeed uh, p constitute an existential threat to Israel, which is not bound by this agreement, but it actually is a fundamental threat to the United States as well, and, and Americans should be concerned about it on its merits and how it impacts them personally. So those those are my thoughts, and uh, I'm sticking to them. And uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to uh, take some. <clears throat> Carolyn, uh, forgive me for being tardy, um, but I gather you were too, so I feel a little bit better. But uh, you, you more than made up for it with, uh, with your presentation, Thank as you. always. Um, could you just speak a little bit further about uh, the consensus in Israel at the moment and the extent to which uh, that may well um, oblige action in the face of this betrayal. So, <clears throat> Israel, you know, everybody always jokes, two Jews, three opinions, but in Israel it's actually uh, two Jews, uh, three very loud and angry opinions. So, <clears throat> what, what's interesting about, or what's, what's extraordinary about this moment in Israeli history is that you, you have three quarters of Israelis not only opposing this deal, but supporting Netanyahu's decision to publicly oppose it and wanting him to continue to do so. So it's not that this is all of the people who oppose the deal, over 80% of Israelis oppose this deal, including Israeli Arabs, but rather three quarters of Israelis support Netanyahu's decision to be outspoken in in his opposition to this deal and and bringing his case to the American public and to Congress. So uh, that is quite quite profound. And 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 um, what this means for Israel? Look, I mean, I think in, in operationally, it's it's hard to know. Uh, but what is what is very clear is that over the past year, in particular, since uh, the last summer's war that uh, Hamas waged against Israel unlawfully from from Gaza, 
and the Americans, uh, the Obama administration, behave so egregiously towards Israel, and you then move from there, where the, you know the United States, in an act of economic warfare, I don't know how else we can can discuss it, uh, closed. Uh, put down an FAA flight ban on Ben Gurion uh, Airport in the middle of a war, and instituted a partial arms embargo against Israel in the middle of a war, and was siding with Hamas and its ceasefire demands against Israel through its interlocutors and in, in the Turks and the the Qataris uh, against Israel throughout the the war, and was only. Uh, brought down by the fact that the Sunni Arab states led by Egypt supported Israel against Hamas in that war. When you when you take America's mistreatment of Israel, the, the Obama administration's ill treatment of Israel during that war, it's act of siding with, with the Hamas terrorist organization against Israel, and you add to that what they're doing today with, with the nuclear deal, there is a very stark awakening among uh, Israelis citizens and among uh, the Israeli security establishment to the fact that we are in a completely different situation than we thought we were in or we had been in in the past with the United States and this requires us to act in certain ways so we've seen a lot of that uh, action right now in terms of Israeli and, and, and maneuvering and the maneuvering of the, of the Arab states uh, that are equally imperiled by Obama's behavior, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Jordan, who are clinging to Israel for dear life right now. So you're seeing a new uh, uh, strategic alliance forming, and it's based on joint interests. I mean, there's no way of knowing how long it will last. I guess it will last until those interests are no longer common. But uh, to operate together in opposition to the United States and its current Islamist partners, Turkey, Qatar, and Iran, uh, uh, to protect uh, their survival and, and their national security. So I, I think that you're going to see some of that, whether Israel will operate, uh, will, will carry out any sort of mission inside of Iran. Look, I mean, I, I trust Netanyahu far more than I trust uh, President Obama when he says that all options are on the table. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank Wait you for, for coming and for your terrific... Oh. Hi, Deborah Weiss. Thank you so much for coming and for your terrific speech. I have a two-part question. The first one is, uh, I heard John Kerry say that this deal would be implemented even if... Congress opposes it, but they're just going to wait until after the vote. So my question to you is, um, is that true? What's the purpose of the vote? And the, second, and the second part of the question is, I still am not clear on why this isn't a treaty. I asked it to uh, n another speaker that we heard, and he said it just seemed not clear about the president could make something a treaty versus an agreement almost at his whim is what it sounded like to me, but I know there are a lot of lawyers who think this is properly a treaty and not being treated as such. Could you comment on that? So, um, you know, in terms of implementation, I mean, I think we have to understand the deal is already being implemented. I mean, the Guardian carried a story uh, a day or two ago uh, talking about how all of these European firms, as well as the Russians, are clamoring, you know, beating a path to Tehran to sign deals with them ahead of the uh, the lifting of the sanctions restrictions now that the UN Security Council has passed its, its resolution. And the Russians are already breaching to the extent that the limitations continue to exist on uh, missile technology transfers to Iran by saying that they're going to be selling uh, S-300 anti-aircraft batteries to Iran um, to make it much more difficult to attack it from the air, to attack its, its nuclear installations from the air. Um, so, you know, I mean, and, and the other thing is that most of the $150 billion that Iran is supposed to get as a signing bonus are uh, being frozen today as a result of UN sanctions that are going to be that are going to be rescinded regardless of the congressional vote. So most of that money is going to end up in Iran's hands, uh, no matter what the Congress does next month. So why does it even matter? Well, it matters. Uh, f it matters for two reasons. I can think of two, and probably I'll think of a third while I'm giving the first two, but <clears throat> the reason why it matters, first of all, is because it's a statement of intention by the U.S. Congress, not only to the Obama administration, but also to the global community, 
that the United States is that the people of the United States does not support do not support Obama's decision to unilaterally collapse uh, before the mullahs of Tehran, and that the American people are not interested in in destroying uh, their strategic standing as a global leader. They're not interested in imperiling American national security, and that with Obama now uh, having 17 more months to go until he leaves, I don't know how often you guys look at that website that gives you the number of days and hours and minutes until the inauguration. <clears throat> not that I've ever looked at it or anything like that, but um, you know, it's uh, it's 17 months, and then uh, there'll be a different policy, as, as Senator Cotton in, indicated in his in his letters to uh, in, his, in the letter that was signed by another 46, I think, senators back uh, several months ago, um, explaining that an executive agreement does not uh, commit uh, either the Congress or or uh, his successor in the White House, Obama's successor in the White House. So it's important as a statement of intentions. It's also important, as Prime Minister Netanyahu said, because if the United States maintains its sanctions regime against Iran, then all of the countries that are interested in, in having trade ties with the Iranians are going to have to weigh that interest with their interest in continuing to maintain economic relations with the United States. So at the end of the day, the fact that the United States is maintaining its sanctions against Iran, even as the rest of the, the international community uh, drops their sanctions against Iran, is going to have a ripple effect throughout the international economy and limit Iran's uh, ability to become enriched as a result of the uh, collapse or the end of the UN sanctions resolutions that have been been applied against it in recent years. So, you know, those are the those are the two reasons, and of course, the third reason is that uh, whoever succeeds Obama in the Oval Office will be much more empowered to abandon his policy regarding Iran uh, if Congress uh, rejects this deal and kills this deal from a, from a statutory perspective. Uh, in the United States from a perspective of American sanctions in the United States. And as to the question of the tree, look, I wrote a column a few weeks ago following Andy McCarthy's article in National Review uh, discussing the prospect of having the Senate and the House passing a joint resolution saying defining the deal as a treaty and, and transferring it to the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee for, for consideration as a treaty. <coughs> and obviously, I thought that it was a fantastic idea. But um, it's also a fantastic idea to view it, to, to say that it, first the NPT needs to be amended as a result of this treaty or this agreement, and, and that also has to go through a treaty approval process in the Senate. But um, I fear, you know, that it, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's not quite clear the whole regulatory framework that this deal has even been been uh, been submitted through I mean, the State Department said okay the clock has started for 60 minute countdown based upon what it's not clear that they even had the authority to do that but all of this process is going along in such a way that by the time that you catch your breath you know the horses not only have left the stable and the shut door but you know you don't even know where they are anymore so I think unfortunately you have the process that was determined to have congressional oversight over this deal. It's a very problematic process, and in many ways it's, it's, it's opposed to the United States Constitution, but uh, it is what it is, and unfortunately, it looks like, unless and I'd be happy, very happy, overjoyed, in fact, to be told otherwise by people who are in a position to, to do something about it. But from what I gather, it's, it's not going to be very easy. It may, in fact, be impossible to change the course for review of this to a treaty. Yeah, Dan. Thanks. Can you just walk us through, I understand your skepticism about the way that the United States would respond if, uh, if hypothetically a new secret site is discovered by U.S. intelligence. Just walk us through your worst case scenario about the way the Obama administration would behave given that we actually discover a place where secret research was taking place. And uh, do you think that they would actually squelch the information and then as it leaked out, you know, kind of step by step, what would be the Obama administration's response? Look, I mean, I think we saw 
what the response was very clearly when the New York Times um, ran an article several weeks ago indicating that Iran was in breach of its commitment to the interim framework, the interim nuclear framework from November of 2013. I mean, you know, it, it was really remarkable, the hysterical and vicious response that the, that the White House and the State Department had to that New York Times article. I mean, David Sanger, he's a friend of theirs, you know, and they just ripped him apart, uh, attacking him. He got false information. I mean, he did not get false information. It was all true. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, much of this was on the public record. So that there was nothing there that they, but they were attacking him viciously. And and by the time that the news cycle was over, it, would, it had become from just a statement of fact. I don't even. From what I recall, he didn't even realize it was a controversial article, you know, to a he said, she said rape case. You know, it, it was just, it, it had become so vicious. And these people clearly, I mean, look at how uh, the president uh, treated his opponents yesterday. The way that he demonized people who opposed this deal was really, I think, without precedent in, in, in American politics. I, I could be wrong, but... You know, I, I couldn't think of another time that, that people had spoken so ill towards one another. <laughs> Maybe, but do you see the uh, president and uh, Ted Cruz having then a 25-year correspondence and ending up in good f fun July 4th, 1826? I mean, you know, it, 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 it's hard to, it's, it's hard to fathom uh, just how vicious they are. Um, we also have seen their moves to um, hide, uh, hide, like I said, you know, information about collaboration between Al Qaeda and Iran. We see that, in fact, you know, it's it's notable. I think when you talk about the whole scope and the and the focal points of of Iran's presence in in Latin America and Cuba being really, you know, uh, the actor that's been instigating and enabling Iran's penetration of Venezuela and Bolivia in recent years, and the the, the Cuban security forces have played a key role. From what I read, uh, I can't remember the name of the in, the foundation here in, in Washington that, that deals with these issues, but they said that uh, it was the Cubans that transferred the identity uh, creation technology essentially to the Venezuelans for the Iranian terrorists that and Hezbollah terrorists that were able to receive uh, Latin American identities uh, from Venezuela. So Cuba has been playing a key role in all of this. And, and then you see that right at the same time that the Obama administration is negotiating this deal with Iran, they suddenly, you know, surprise everybody and take Cuba off of the uh, state sponsor of terrorism list and reinstate diplomatic relations with Havana. And, you know, all of these things are happening at the same time. And, you know, this makes it much more difficult as a practical matter for the United States to be able to point to the extraordinary threat that Cuban-Iranian collaboration in Latin America poses for the United States. Because they're taking the exact opposite position, right? They're saying that Cuba isn't a threat to the United States and that really the United States was bad to have supported Batista or I don't know what, you know, bad pigs, yada, yada. And, and not talking about the fact that actually at this point of time, you know, um, and I think that this was another O'Grady article, that actually at this point of time, Iran has become, the Iranian regime, the uh, Cuba has become, the Cuban regime has become an enabler of jihadist terrorism in Latin America, of jihadist terror uh, proliferation network proliferation in Latin America, in South America, and in Central America that threatens directly the United States of America. So, you know, how will they respond? How are they responding now to Parchin? I mean, have you seen uh, Secretary of State John Kerry coming out, or President Obama, or even their spokespeople coming out and saying, if this is what it appears to be, that they are trying to 
hide, deliberately destroy evidence of nuclear operations in Parchin, that this constitutes indeed a material breach of the agreement that we achieved and that we need to have start that 24-day verification process in the UN Security Council. I mean, we don't see them doing that. I don't think we see them doing much of anything, and, I'm hope, and I assume that they want this story to go away, and if it doesn't go away, then they'll start attacking the Wall Street Journal and you know, Rupert Murdoch, and then they'll try to figure out a way to get Adelson involved in all of this. And, and, and you know, and then we're just going to have this media circus attacking conservative partisans and extremists and Jews. Yes, Fritz. Uh, my oh. question is, it, even if we don't get 67, if we get 60 in the Senate and a majority in the House and send a resolution of rejection to... Obama, and he vetoes it, and we can't override. Doesn't that still have two effects? One is, doesn't that do something of a signal that America is not really behind this? Uh, well, actually, three. Two, doesn't it uh, help the next president uh, be able to repudiate it? And three, wouldn't it be a helpful signal to people in Israel that you're, it isn't America that's abandoning you, it's Obama? Yes, I mean yes to all all of those all of those things. It's true, and I think it's very important. Look, I personally believe that. Uh, no, let me say it differently. I'm not thinking right now about what the chance of success or failure is in this undertaking. Um, what I'm thinking about is doing my level best to. Uh, bring about a maximum number of members of Congress and Senate uh, to oppose this deal, and whatever the outcome is going to end up being, um, you never lose by fighting for what's right. And so, you know, and you guys are all doing it here in Washington, so I applaud you, and, um, you know, uh, and it, what did what did uh, what did Lincoln say? God is not indifferent to uh, the outcome of this process. So I I believe that. <laughs> yes, Sarah. Thanks, Carolyn. Um, always brilliant. Always. Um, you know, we have been very, very concerned for some time now since Obama has started making this into a binary equation. It's either the steel or war. Mm -hmm. But I'm very, very worried because Israel is being so thrown under the tank, Listen, the rest of us are being thrown under the bus, that this might become a self-fulfilling prophecy in order to, for Israel to survive, that they might have to launch some attack. And, um, you know, th this will make um, Obama's false equation true. No, it won't. How? Well, first of all, it's false, right? It is false. Right? So it will never be true. Yes, but we, um, Israel might have to go to war just in order to survive. But Obama said, I mean, you know, Obama is so, so, you know, God bless him. <laughs> he's, just, he, he's always got another stem winder. And he, I mean, you know, he keeps saying over and over again that there's a binary thing here, right? Either you go with me or you go to war, right? But then... You know, according to uh, the official statement that the National Jewish De Democratic Council's chairman, uh, Greg Rosenbaum, put out after the meeting ended on, on Tuesday afternoon, he said that Obama said, uh, if Congress rejects this agreement, there's not going to be a war. Really? You know, and then, and then you say, and then he says, no, there's not going to be a war. Um, uh, Iran is going to respond in an asymmetric manner and um, that it will target uh, American military installations in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Gulf, in the Middle East, and its major target is going to be Tel Aviv and missiles are going to fall on Tel Aviv. But he said it's not going to be a war, right? And, you know, what are missiles on Tel Aviv? Missiles on Tel Aviv is a war against Israel. It's not a war against the United States. And when he's fear-mongering like this and saying that, so then you ask yourself, okay, this is really interesting, Mr. President. So you're saying 
by your view of things, A, it's not going to involve the United States in a war. Let me just preface. He said that Iran will then vacate its signature on the agreement and it will go back to enriching uranium. The United States is going to be forced to attack Iran's nuclear installations to prevent them from acquiring weapons-grade uranium to develop bombs. So this is going to happen. The United States is going to attack Iran, and then what's going to happen? Iran is not going to respond by opening war against the United States. Rather, it will carry out some limited airstrikes or terrorist attacks or whatever against American installations in the, in the Middle East, and primarily it is going to target Israel with rockets. So this is not an unreasonable scenario at all. Um, it's a reasonable one. I don't know if it's the most likely scenario because, of course, when Israel targeted uh, Iraq's nuclear reactor in 1981 and when it targeted Syria's Iranian-financed North Korean-built nuclear reactor in 2007, both countries had no response. So maybe Iran will respond, maybe Iran won't respond, but the response that he claimed that Iran would take in the event of an American military strike against Iran's nuclear installations, he said, is less than what he's claiming it's going to be in pronouncement after pronouncement after pronouncement. Now, having said that, and this is a reasonable scenario, what he pointed out, I don't, I don't think that there's any way to say that this is an unlikely scenario, what he's saying. But I, just as I don't think it's an unlikely scenario, neither does the vast majority of the Israeli public. So you have to ask yourself then, since the Israeli public is begging for Congress to kill this deal, and the vast majority of the Israeli public recognizes that this is the sort of scenario that we're likely going to have to face if Israel or the United States or another actor carries out a military attack against Iran's nuclear installations, then why does Israel oppose the deal? Right? We, what, what is it that is causing Israelis to say, bring it on, we prefer that this deal is killed and a missile strike against Tel Aviv to this deal being carried out. The message that Israelis are giving in this case is that we recognize that the danger of having to deal with, you know, 100,000 missiles falling down from the skies vis from, from Hezbollah in Lebanon, or another 40,000 missiles from Gaza, from Hamas, both Iranian proxies, is more desirable more desirable than what we are likely going to have to face if this deal is implemented. And so if this is what the Israelis are saying, and by Obama's own telling, Israel is going to be the primary victim, right, of an Iranian response to an American military strike against its nuclear installations, then what does that mean about what America is doing? What does that mean about the strategic implications of this deal for Israel, for the United States, and for the, 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 the world a, as a whole? That, that's really the question. All right, I'm going to take one last question, and then I, and then I do have to, to get going. Hi, Louise Vasilakis. What makes sense to me is that we've already, America has already been checkmated. That Iran has the bomb, and there's other uh, capabilities that have been, we've been threatened by. That makes sense to me. I'd like you to speak to that. I, I didn't understand the question. That you think that the United States is doing this to respond to a threat that we don't know about because Iran already has the bomb? We have an existential threat. That the United States thinks that it's going to feed the tiger with Israel and then it's not going to get hungry again? <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's basically the logic at hand here. It's saying, okay, they already have nukes. They can already destroy us. They're planning on destroying us. And so what we're going to do is we're going to buy ourselves a little bit of time by giving them Israel. You know, I mean, I guess that's likely, but is... No, but I mean, but, but again, let me just say, if this is in the case, just take this as a hypothetical. If this is the case, is this the best response <laughs> that the United States has in what, you know, Obama, you know, likes to call his toolbox? How Harvard of him, <coughs> you know. What would be a better response? I think that if the, if the United States is now being subjected to nuclear blackmail by Iran, then there's a very clear response. You take down the regime, period. You know, no ifs, and or buts. I mean, if they're saying, we're going to nuke you, right, then the action that the United States would say, no, you're not. You're not going to be able to because tomorrow there will be no, no Iranian regime. I mean, that, that would be... 
that would be a reasonable response. And if this has been going on for some time, after all, the United States entered into this secret diplomacy that led to the interim deal with the Iranians when? In the summer of 2013 or in the end of 2012. So this has, at, at a minimum, been going on for, for, for nearly three years. And if this you know, has been hanging over the United States like a sword of Damocles for the past three years, this, this, this Iranian blackmail, then it seems to me that during this time the United States had any number of opportunities, for instance, every single day since this threat became manifest or known to the United States, to take actions to destroy the Iranian regime uh, in order to ensure the survival of the United States. That, that you know, you don't it doesn't take anybody well schooled in in, uh, in nuclear diplomacy to understand that if somebody is threatening you with annihilation, then you destroy them first. Especially if you think that there's any credibility to their threats. And if the United States thinks that there's credibility to their threats, then the exact opposite of what they should be doing is catering to it or expanding it. Anyway, I got to go. Thank you thank very you. much. Well done.